the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library Museum. I'm Tom Schwartz, the director. Uh, you're in for a big treat. I have known Catherine Harris for several decades. Um, she is one of the neatest ladies you are ever going to meet. She is the director of the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library. She's been a librarian her entire life. And it was out of her career as a librarian that she realized that people, especially younger folks, were thirsting for more of a connection with history. Books are wonderful, but sometimes you need to make what's in the books come alive and be more personal. And it was because of that she created the character, uh, she decided to read everything she could on Harriet Tubman. And she decided that she would create this persona and this presentation. I have seen it many times. It's never the same twice. She continues to read all of the new work coming out on Harriet Tubman. And so the way to, to deal with this is that when she comes out, she'll be in character. Uh, when she's through with her presentation, she'll remain in character and ask you to ask questions. And then when she's through, she'll be inviting you to come up and look at some of the books she's brought, some of the uh, informational materials, as well as uh, some worksheets, if you'd like to take them, for those of you who are teachers. And uh, you can ask your questions either about Harriet or about <coughs> Catherine Harris. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me present Harriet Tubman. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Now that's more like it. I want to thank y'all for inviting me. I want to thank y'all for inviting me so I can tell you about the work that I've done on the railroad. Now you may think it odd that I, a woman, worked on the railroad. But I did work on the railroad, the Underground Railroad, that is. Now, before I go any further, I have to tell you a little story. You see, the story has it that there was this slave, and he was making his escape. Now, that's a mighty risky and dangerous thing for a slave to do, escape, uh, or at least try to anyway. But nevertheless, this slave was being chased by a slave catcher. And the captain of the slave catchers come up to him and he said, Sam, what happened to that slave you was a chasing? And Sam said, I don't rightly know, sir. He must have just caught some underground road because he just plum disappeared. Now before I go any further, I have to tell you something else. And that is, the Underground Railroad, why, it wasn't even underground. <laughs> the Underground Railroad, why, it wasn't even a railroad in the true sense of the word. So if it wasn't underground and it wasn't a railroad, then what, pray tell, was it? Well, I'm going to tell you that too. You see, uh, what the railroad was, it was a connection. It was a network of people and places. Now, you see, the people that work on the railroad, they belong to a group called themselves abolitionists. Now, there was white abolitionists. There was colored abolitionists, too. But you see, they all work together for the same reason. You see, an abolitionist believe that slavery is wrong. An abolitionist believe that families ought not be separated. 
An abolitionist believed that mamas ought not have their babies ripped out their arms and sold away, never to be seen again in life. An abolitionist believed that no man should own another. Now I said the railroad was a connection, a network of people and places, and I've told you a little bit about the people, so now I'll tell you a little bit about the places. The places on the railroad, and we call those places stations, why a station might be a barn, it might be a cellar, might be an attic, might be the back of a wagon, it might be the forest, the swamps, all outside. Because you see what the railroad really was, was a way to freedom for the escaping slaves. didn't tell you my name, did I? Well, my name is Harriet. Harriet Tubman. Folks call me Moses. Y'all know about Moses, don't you? Y'all know that in the Bible, Moses led his folks from slavery to freedom. And since I, Harriet Tubman, have led my folks from slavery to freedom, Folks call me Moses, too. <laughs> now, I was born a slave. I was born a slave in Dorchester County, Maryland. I was born in 1820. Of course, it could have been 1821. Could have been 1822. Might even been 1823, because you see, don't nobody care about no slave having a birthday. But I was born, because I'm standing here before you today. Now, on that plantation where I was born there in Dorchester County, Maryland, it was owned by a man whose name was Master Brodus. And on Master Brodus's plantation, I worked in the field. And I got to be as strong as any man. But you see, I had heard about something called freedom. And I decided, I wanted to have me some of that. <laughs> so in 18 and 49, I decided that I was going to be free. And with the help of those kindly abolitionist folks that I told y'all about, I got to my freedom. Now you see, I had heard that if I could get on that Underground Railroad, then I could get to my freedom. I'd heard about that railroad from other slaves who had heard about it from other slaves who had heard about it from other slaves who had heard about it from other slaves and so forth and so on because you see the Underground Railroad is secret. But more important than that, why that Underground Railroad, it is also illegal. But I was told that if I could get on it, that I could get to my freedom. So with the help of those kindly abolitionist folks, I got on that railroad, and I got to my freedom. Those kind of abolitionist folks told me that when I got, not if I got, but when I got from Dorchester County, Maryland, to Philadelphia, that I would be free. And I want y'all to know that when I got there to Philadelphia, I looked at my hands, I looked at my feet, same hands, same feet, except for one thing, they was free! <laughs> and such a glory come over me, it was almost more than I could stand. 
Now those kind of abolitionist folks also told me that when I got there to Philadelphia, I should look for a man whose name was Mr. William Still. Now, Mr. William Still was a free Negro. He was not a slave. Mr. William Still was an important Negro as well. You see, Mr. Still was the secretary to the Anti-Slavery Society right there in Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. But more important than all of that, Mr. Still was a station master on the Underground Railroad. So like I said, I got there in Philadelphia in 18 and 49, and I stayed there for two years. And while I was there, I hired myself out as a cook and a washerwoman. And with the money that I earned, I give it back to Mr. Steele because you see, it takes money to operate the Underground Railroad. Well, Mr. Steele and I, we got to be very fast friends and over time he taught me all about the operation of the Underground Railroad. So in 1851, Mr. Steele decided that since I, Harriet Tubman, had made my own escape to freedom with the help of those kindly abolitionist folks that I told you about, he decided that I might be the kind of person who could be a conductor on his railroad. So in 1851, I started making my trips as a conductor on the Underground Railroad. And I want y'all to know that one of the very first stops that I made as a conductor was I went right back to Dorchester County, Maryland. I went right back to Master Brodus's plantation. And I spirited away my brothers and their family. Took them all the way up into Canada where they could truly be free. Now over time, I made about 13 trips on that railroad. You see, on that railroad, we mostly traveled at night, here in the day. At night, we follow that North Star, follow that drinking gourd. Sometimes we even follow the moss that grows on the north side of the trees because you see all roads that head north, they lead to freedom. Well, long about 18 and 55, <laughs> that's when I was doing some of my best work. <laughs> Those Maryland plantation owners, they had a bounty. They had a reward for my capture. They had them signs, wanted Harriet Tubman, dead or alive. That bounty money started off at about $12,000. But by the time 18 and 55 come on, that bounty money had grown all the way to $40,000. But you know what? <laughs> nobody never did claim it, because nobody never could catch me. And I'm going to tell you why. It's because I, Harriet Tubman, I never run my train off the track, and I never lost a passenger. All of those who traveled with me, they all got to freedom. Well, pretty soon though, we hear about the coming of a war, and that war come on in 1861. But before I tell you about what I done in the war, I have to tell you about my last trip that I took as a conductor on the Underground Railroad. <coughs> Now, y'all remember Master Brodus, 
who I told you about lived there in Dorchester County, Maryland. Well, I made my last trip along about 1859, 1860. By that time, Master Brodus, he died. He passed on. I didn't shed now a tear for him. <laughs> but he passed on, and before he died, Master Brodus sold his property to a man whose name was Old Doc Thompson. And in 1859, 1860, old Doc Thompson had some property that meant a great deal to me. So at that time, 1859, 1860, I went right back to Dorchester County, Maryland. I went right back to old Doc Thompson's plantation. This time I spirited away to freedom, my aging mama and my agent, Papa, took them all the way up into Canada where they could join with my brothers and their families and the whole family be free. Well, like I said, heard about that war coming on, and it did come on in 1861. That'd be the Civil War, you know. <coughs> During that war, I, Harriet Tubman, because there was still work to do for the cause of freedom. I, Harriet Tubman, I done that work as well. Now you're probably wondering, well, Miss Tubman, what you do in the war? Well, I'm gonna tell you. During that war, I served as a scout and a nurse. in Mr. Lincoln's army. I was also a spy. And I'd done it for the cause of freedom. Now even though I'd done that work, I never did get no fair pay for my service, but I'd done it anyhow because it was for the cause of freedom. But even at the end of the war, there was still work to do. And I, Harriet Tubman, I did that work as well. After I'd served in Mr. Lincoln's army during the war, at the close of the war, I worked for the Freedmen's Bureau. Now, do y'all know what the Freedman's Bureau is? Some of you do and some of you don't, so I figured I'd have to tell you. The Freedman's Bureau was set up by the federal government toward the end of the war. Now, funny as it might sound, it was set up by the federal government to help them former slaves Learn how to be free. You see, what that Freedman's Bureau done was taught them former slaves how to uh, present themselves for work. You see, they already knew how to work, having been a slave and all, but how to present themselves for work, get paid for their labors, keep the money for themselves, and be their own masters for a change. But I'm going to tell you, one of the best things that Freedman's Bureau done was taught them former slaves how to read and write. Because in slavery days, against the law, teach a slave how to read and write. Well, I stayed there working with the Freedman's Bureau for some time, but when that war come to a close in 1865, hmm, lots of things happened. You see, during that war back in 1863, Father Abraham, that's what we called him, Father Abraham, he gave out that Emancipation Proclamation. Then in April of 65, you had that 
surrender their Appomattox. And then, come December of 1865, you got the signing of that 13th Amendment, and you mix all of that together. You have the end or the abolition of slavery. So, at the close of the war, there wasn't no more need for the Underground Railroad, so it just closed up. But I told y'all what I done at the close of the war, because it was for the cause of freedom, but around that same time, told y'all about my mom and my papa that I took all the way up into Canada. Well, at the close of the war, I went back up into Canada, and I brought them back across the falls, that be Niagara Falls. And I settled in a place called Auburn, New York. And that's where I live today. I live in Auburn, New York. And it is there that I take care of my aging mama and my aging papa. But you see, I've also opened my home to other former slaves who's getting old and up in years and don't have no one to care for them. So the folks there in Auburn, they say I operate an old folks home. <laughs> and I reckon that I do. So now, I mostly just reflect. I think about the work that I done on the railroad. And I want y'all to know that working on the railroad was hard work, dangerous work, and risky work. But you know what? I'm mighty glad I done it. Now, before I go, I'm wondering if there might be any of you who have a question you'd like to ask me. Well, we got someone right at the start who have a question. <laughs> Most times I have to kind of urge people <laughs> to have a question. And I want y'all to know also that you can ask me anything that you want, and I'll try my best to answer. So, sir, you want to ask the first question? You're calling me son? <laughs> no, I said sir. Oh. <laughs> my question was, did you have any connection with John Brown? Did I have any connection with John Brown? Well, y'all have heard, I'm sure, about that raid, Harper's Ferry. Well, I'm going to tell you. Me and Frederick. Y'all know who Frederick is? Mm -hmm. Who is he? Douglas. Frederick Douglass. Well, I'm mighty proud of y'all. <laughs> Me and Frederick, we met up with John Brown up in Canada where John Brown was coming up with that plan of his to arm the slaves in the South, have an uprising kill all the masters, <coughs> kill all the white folks. <coughs> they was gonna raid that place called Harper's Ferry, which was a munitions storage area. Well, John Brown got some folks to do that. Of course now, me and Frederick, I, I, I was not very well when the time come for the raid. I had a... What year was that? I believe it was 54. I'm not exactly I'm just sure. testing you. <laughs> what you testing me for, sir? <laughs> Go ahead. You're doing fine. <laughs> well, I'm mighty glad that you think I'm doing fine when I'm telling you the story of my own life. <laughs> Went on that raid, kind of 
glad we didn't because it was a disaster. John Brown come to a bad end. <laughs> but you know what? Even though he come to a bad end, I consider John Brown a martyr for my people. John Brown and Mr. Lincoln, best two white men I ever know. Yes, give their life for freedom. Give their life for my people. He come to a bad end, but he done what he thought was right. Fiery abolitionist, long flowing hair. Started out his abolitionist work there in Kansas. I believe it was called Osawatomi or something like that. I'm not quite sure how you say it. But nevertheless, move on across the country, head down to Virginia, all up in there, for the cause of freedom. Took some of his sons with him. They came to a bad end too. But it was for the cause of freedom. That answer your question, sir? I have one further question. But you can't ask but one at a time. <laughs> we have to let someone else ask. Yeah. All right. Yes, ma'am, right here. What do you consider your, your greatest achievement? Pardon me? What do you consider your greatest achievement? Living. <laughs> <laughs> that I'm still alive today. <laughs> that I'm free. That'd be my greatest achievement. You got one? I guess she don't got it. <laughs> How about you, ma'am? Could you tell the story about the first time you went back to the land and you got your first people and went on the railroad? What you want to know? I already told you what it done. <laughs> I want to know, like, what it was like. It was scary. Did they see you, or how did you connect with them? Oh, how did I connect with them? Well... You see, <coughs> this is what I've done for most of my travels on the railroad. I would uh, tell a trusted abolitionist friend that I was going to be at such and such a place, at such and such a time, on such and such a date. And if you wanted to ride with me, on the Freedom Line, <clears throat> then you come there and I will get you. <clears throat> now, I also want y'all to know that my passengers, that's what I call them, those who traveled with me, my passengers, my passengers chose themselves. That was something folks asked me. How did you decide who was going to travel with you? I didn't decide. How is it going to look if I'm going to say, you can go you can't go, you can go, you can't go, you can go. How that's going to look? The only person that knows if they want to be free is you. I can't tell you. But I will tell you this. If you want to travel with me, you have to do as I say. You see. John Brown even before he come to his bad end, and he met me up there in Canada, <laughs> he started calling me General Tubman. Because <laughs> he said I was in charge. And that's the kind of person that John, t that John Brown needed, you see. So he chose me, you know, to go with him. What you ask me? <laughs> what I really wanted to know, and I think now I know the answer, was you didn't go up to their homes and look now, at the Now, what it look like, not, 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 I'm Harriet, I come to take you to freedom. I don't believe it worked like that. Just a little bit of common sense go a long way. You know what, that, that's something else. Have to have common sense to travel on the railroad. You see, my mama, she always told me I was quick on my feet insofar as thinking was concerned. But it always, it, I, I never could understand how come white folks would say, 
Slaves, colored folks is slow and stupid and dumb and can't learn. Well, I'm going to tell you this. If you manage to get on the railroad, you better have your wits about you. And you better be sharp on your feet and understand and do as you told. That makes sense to you, ma'am? I saw another hand. How about you right there? What was the closest that you came to ever getting caught? In Close the don't count, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> Were you ever afraid? Was I ever what? Afraid. What'd you think? I told you it was hard work, <laughs> risky work. Was you paying attention? <laughs> and dangerous work. But even though I said close don't count, I will tell you, do y'all want to know? Yes. 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 Oh, okay. I'll tell you about a close call. I have had several of them. But like I said, I Harriet Tubman. I never run my train off the track, and I never lost a passenger. All those who traveled with me, they all got the freedom. But I'm going to tell you, on my travels, I would stop in Wilmington, Delaware, to see my friend. My friend's name is Thomas Garrett. Thomas Garrett is a Quaker. The Quakers were some of the most biggest supporters of the abolitionist movement. Y'all know that, didn't you? Mm -hmm. Of course now, lots of other denominations, I believe is the word, they were supporters of this <coughs> abolitionist movement too. But the Quakers, huh, they have been again that slavery thing for years and years. But nevertheless, when I would travel to Wilmington, Delaware, I would stop to see my friend named Thomas Garrett. And I called him friend, friend Garrett because the Quakers also call themselves friends, and they are certainly friends to the escaping slaves. So Thomas Garrett was friend, friend Garrett. Do y'all know Thomas Garrett? No. Some of you do. You know him? Well, mighty fine. I think you should check with this man to confirm and to see if I'm saying the right story. I'm nerdy, Chad. Well, when I'm done, sir. Thomas Garrett lived there in Wilmington, Delaware. And Thomas Garrett was a staunch, radical abolitionist. Now, you know that if you was an abolitionist, you could be thrown in jail, have your property confiscated, be fined, and all manner of bad things happen to you. Thomas Garrett was a rich man. Thomas Garrett was thrown in jail, fined, his property was confiscated. <coughs> Thomas Garrett made shoes, among other things, and he made many a pair of shoes for me and my travels. He and my passengers. Nevertheless, they sold Thomas Garrett in jail on more than one occasion. But his abolitionist friends, they all come together and they get him out of jail and they manage to get his property back and all of that. Over time, Thomas Garrett helped more than 2,500 of my people, sheltered them in the safety of his safe house right there in Wilmington, Delaware. That's the kind of person Thomas Garrett was, committed to the cause of freedom and to the abolition of slavery. Well, so I stopped there one day and Thomas Garrett said, Harriet, I have a friend across town who has some provisions for you and your passengers <laughs> and you have to go across town to get them. So I said okay and that'd be fine and show me how to tell me how to get there. So I did what he said and got over across town and on my way back. 
Well, when I got over there, the provisions turned out to be live chickens on the foot. <laughs> so I put these live chickens on the foot in a bag, put them over my shoulder, and start my journey back over to friend Garrett's house, his safe house. Well, on my way, I passed through an area where there were some stores, and on the walls, they was these pictures. I found out, or I figured out, that they was wanted posters. Wanted. Harriet Tubman. Dead or alive. Now, I can neither read nor write, but I do know what I look like. <laughs> so, these white men, they was just sitting there looking and talking about and looking up at that posters. So I said, oh my what I'm going to do. Like I told y'all, my mama said I was quick on my feet. <laughs> so I took the chickens off my shoulder, opened that bag up, and them chickens started flopping around. Them white men said, look at that little old colored woman chasing after them chickens. Little did they know that that little colored woman chasing after them chickens was that same woman whose face was on that poster. <laughs> I'd say that was a close call. <laughs> but I want y'all to know, we never did have no chicken that night. <laughs> we just kept on walking for the cause of freedom. That answer your question, ma'am? How about you, right? Have you asked a question? All right. Um, I'm just interested in how you managed to get your elderly folks, parents, out of the place because you would have had to gotten them out at night and this was a situation where you actually went to them. Was you with me? <laughs> no. Oh, no. I'm, this is the question. Oh, were you actually, did you actually go to them or did you have them meet you somewhere and then you moved them Since on? I knowed where they lived, I went to them. Okay. You see. But I know when it was a good time to go, because folks had told me, and they'd also told my mama and my papa that I was going to come, you see. So that's how I done it. I also took old Doc Thompson's wagon for the first leg of my journey. <laughs> <laughs> but I took them all the way up into Canada where they could be free with my brothers and their families. Did that answer your question, ma'am? Pretty much. Well, what else do you want to know? <laughs> I get another question? No, not right now. <laughs> How about you, man? Well, I was just wondering, Harriet, there must have been signals along the road or around, along your way. Signals? Well, like, it's safe to come in here or, mm -hmm. or is isn't safe to keep mm -hmm. on going. What were those signals? Well, some, some, sometimes a, a, a signal might be a a curtain hanging in the window, a certain color, or pull back to either the right side or the left side and tied back with a certain color string. That that could be a signal. Sometimes there might be a smoke coming out the window, not out the window, out the chip. Smoke be coming out your window, your house probably. Smoke coming out the chimney, especially in the kitchen. Not the kitchen, but in the main house. Because y'all know oftentimes the kitchen was in a separate place. <coughs> and in the summertime, if you see smoke coming out the chimney in the big house, that's sometimes a message that that's a safe house. Then there have been times where folks have laid a quilt on a fence post to let you know that that be a safe place. So that there was sometimes it'd be the call of a bird. Sometimes it might be a certain wagon that might come along that might have certain markings on it that you know, because me and my passengers, we have rolled in the back of wagons with potatoes covering us all up. It, it, you just have to do what you have to do, ma'am. You understand that? I do. Good. Mm -hmm. I 
seed another hand. How about you? Uh, do you see many similarities between the Underground Railroad? Similarities, what that mean? <laughs> <laughs> Things that are the same. Oh, well, between, why didn't you just say that? <laughs> between the Underground Railroad and smuggling immigrants from the Mexican border. Uh, smuggling immigrants from the Mexican border? I don't know nothing about that, sir. <laughs> How about you? Yes, I know that you're... Last name was Tuma. Did you ever marry or have children? <laughs> Why is it folks always want to know about my personal business? <laughs> but I told you, you can ask me anything. <laughs> now, I'm going to tell you. I was born Araminta Green Ross. Araminta Ross was the name that my mama gave me. My mama's name was Harriet Green Ross, and my papa's name was Benjamin Ross. Now, you got all that understood? <laughs> when I was a child, folks used to call me Minty. That'd be Araminta, Minty for short. But you know what? When I decided that I was going to be free, I changed my name to Harriet to honor my mother. I done that because I was free and I could do what I wanted. <laughs> now, now how do I get from Harriet Green Ross to Harriet Tubman? That's because I got married. <laughs> I got married to a man whose name was John Tubman. Now, you see, John Tubman was a free man. John Tubman lived on the neighboring plantation to Master Brothers. But John Tubman had bought his freedom from his master. I think he told me about $400 that he had saved up over time because John Tubman hired himself out, you see. Y'all know what that means? Hire yourself out? Okay. But some of the money that John Tubman earned from hiring himself out, he had to give back to his master. I guess for his room and keep. I guess because he didn't have nowhere else to stay, so he just stayed there. <coughs> well, John Tubman took a liking to me. And he come according with Master Brodus's permission Master Brodus give the permission for me and John Tubman to marry up. Me and John Tubman, we married up in 18 and 47. Me and John Tubman married up in the slave way. Do you know what that means? <laughs> me and John Tubman jumped the broom. Now, that jumping the broom thing, my mama said, told me this, was one of them things that come with us to this place when they brung us all the way from Africa all them 1600 times, whenever it was, 1700s, all that. That was one of the things that the white masters allowed us to keep for our own. You see, they took away the way we talk, the way we dress, the way we worship, they took all that away from us. I guess they wanted us to be like they was. But they didn't think that this jump in the broom would hurt nothing, so they allowed us to keep it. So me and John Tubman married up in the slave way in 18 and 47. But in 18 and 49, when I, Harriet Tubman, decided that I was going to be free, I said to John Tubman, John Tubman, do you want to be free with me on free soil? John Tubman said he was already free and he wasn't going nowhere. I said, well, I ain't free, so I left. <laughs> but when I come back in 18 and 51 to get my brothers and their family on one of my earliest trips on the railroad, I thought I'd stop by to see if old John Tubman was still in the area. 
and he was. But you know what? Mm -hmm. John Tubman had took up with another woman. <laughs> so that was all of me and John Tubman. <laughs> but I don't want y'all to fret because now I have husband number two. <laughs> now, do y'all know of a man whose name is Nelson Davis? I know y'all have never heard of him. Nelson Davis is husband number two. Now, I'm going to tell you about Nelson Davis, since you don't know nothing about him. Nelson Davis was born a slave. Nelson was born in the deep south. That's what we call Mississippi, the deep south. He was born there, but long about 1863 or early 1864, I don't know exactly when, he heard about that proclamation that Father Abraham had given out. One of the things it said in that proclamation, something like this, was that if any escaping slave can make his way to any area that is being occupied by Union troops in the Confederate territory, then if that slave make his way there, vow his allegiance to the Union Army, vow to fight for the cause of freedom, then come the close of the war, he'd get his freedom. So that's just what my Nelson done. My Nelson made his way all the way from Mississippi to Buford, South Carolina. And in 1863, 64, Buford was indeed being occupied by Union forces. So my Nelson joined. United States Colored Troops, 2nd South Carolina, served till the close of the war, got his freedom. I want y'all to know that nigh on to 200,000 of my people served in the Union Army, Union Navy. Freedom just wasn't give to us. We fought, bled, died for our freedom, just like Union soldiers, because we was Union soldiers. You understand my meaning? After that war come to a close, and I was working in the Freedman's Bureau, I was working there in Buford. Nelson, <laughs> He come to Buford too. <laughs> Nelson took a liking to me. Followed me all the way to Auburn, New York. And in 1869, me and Nelson married up. This time we married up in the Christian way. We married up in a church right there in Auburn, New York. Me and Nelson been together Oh, five years now. Oh, did I tell you? Nelson is also 20 years my junior. <laughs> but I want y'all to know, in case you's wondering, never did have no cheering of my own. Told you what happened to me and John Tubman. By the time me and Nelson got together, I was too old to have any babies. But them cheering, they travel with me, on the railroad, my nephews and nieces, and other children. I consider them my children. Mm -hmm. That answer your question, ma'am? Well. Probably told you more than what you <laughs> wanted to know, but I thought you needed to know that. Uh, is anyone in here in charge of how long I can do this? <laughs> or can I just keep going? Because I see, I see more hands. All right. How about you, sir? Well, thank you. <clears throat> in your Underground Railroad history, did you... Now, can you all hear him in the back? Yeah. Go, go ahead. 
In your Underground Railroad history, did you have any activity in this area? And now, just refresh my memory. When you, when you, I, as to what area I am in. in, in the Midwest here, particularly where we are now. Which is Iowa. Iowa. Yes. <laughs> I've never been there, sir. <laughs> but I'ma tell you, William Steele, the man who I told y'all about, mm -hmm. was the secretary to the Anti-Slavery Society. He's a big man in the Underground Railroad. He told me that that Underground Railroad run all the way up into Canada, all the way down into Florida, them Seminole Indians even, they'd be a part of the railroad, go all the way west to a place called Texas. Now, is this place called Iowa somewhere in there? It's north, north well, of Texas. Then I believe that it probably was running in that place. Y'all ever heard of Levi Coffin? He's from a place called Ohio. He's the president, that's what we call it, of the Underground Railroad. I've never met him or never been to Ohio, but these are things that, that I was told by Mr. Steele. That answer your question? I've heard... <clears throat> Wait a minute. It sounds like you're getting ready to say up something else and we want to give somebody else a, a chance. I'll come back to you. That would be great. How about you right there? How many passengers did you usually have on your trip? It's hard to say, ma'am, because I took whoever come. Sometimes it might be two, like my mom and my papa. Sometimes it might be six or eight, like my brother's. Sometimes it might be 10 or 20. But you know what? It never did matter. Because if you wanted to get to freedom, then you come with me. I made about 13 trips. Some folks have said, I wasn't keeping no count, that I might have led as many as two or 300 to freedom. I just know I led to freedom however many wanted to go with me, you see. How about you? Did you ever meet Mr. Lincoln? Did I ever meet Mr. Lincoln? And speak to him. And speak to him. <laughs> now, I want to ask you a question. <laughs> Our Harriet Tubman was a fugitive slave until the close of the war. I never did buy my freedom from nobody. Nobody never did buy it for me. So for all intents and purposes, I was a fugitive slave till the end of the war. Now how it's going to look, <laughs> how it's going to look if Master Lincoln, Father Abraham, be associating with me, a fugitive slave. Now I'm going to tell you this. Father Abraham knowed of my work. I knowed about Father Abraham's work, but I just kind of moved that little freedom thing along by helping folks on the railroad. So in a word, no, I never <laughs> did meet Father Abraham face to face. But I will tell you, y'all heard of Sojourner Truth. Yeah. Yes. She met Father Abraham called the auntie. She was in the White House. She was one of a few folks who looked like me who got to see Father Abraham. Frederick did too. And I believe there was a, a group of pastors, ministers of color who got to have a visit with the president. Wasn't very many of us. But like I said, when Father Abraham got shot and that John Wilkes Booth man killed him, it was one of the saddest days for us colors. It really was. He had given his life. Because that man, John Wilkes Booth, on that last speech or so that Father Abraham made, 
He said something about giving the colored man the vote huh. for his service in the war. John Wilkes Booth said, that'd be the last speech you'll make, and I'd be damned, sorry, if it wasn't, because he killed it. It was a very sad day, not only for the colors, it was a sad day for our nation. You understand, <coughs> ma'am, if that answer your question? Yes, Minty. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> yes, sir. Some money must have been required to feed people. Mm -hmm. and it costs money to operate the Underground Railroad. I told you that earlier. <laughs> but where did it come from? From kindly abolitionist folks, folks who believed in the cause of freedom. Did you know that Queen Victoria even sent money to William Steele, said give it to Harriet for the work that she's doing? Did you know that, ma'am? No, did not know that. Well, now you but do. I, but I know it now. <laughs> yes, sir. Did you ever learn to read? No, I never did. I never did. But I do. And I think this is really something. I never did learn to read or write. I still have to make my mark. Y'all know what that means? Have to make your mark and somebody have to uh, attest that this is Harriet Tubman's mark. But you see, even though I can neither read nor write, I do have a book wrote about me. Ain't that something? There's my book. It's wrote about me. I'm sorry. We'll try to forgive you. <laughs> this is the book that's been wrote about me. Can you read? Would you come up here? Now, even though I can neither read nor write, I have remembered every word that's on this page. And if you mess up, I'll know it. <laughs> okay, so what, what's it say on here? Scenes in the life of Harriet Tubman. That's me. No, I'm sorry. Keep going. By Sarah H. Bradford. Do y'all know who Sarah H. Bradford is? No. Sarah H. Bradford is a kindly Quaker abolitionist woman who lived there in Auburn. And when I moved there to Auburn at the close of the war, you know, to stay, I'd lived there in Auburn off and on over the years. You know, I, I bought my first house there in Auburn. And uh, y'all heard of William Seward? Yeah. Yes. Who was he? You? Secretary of State. To who? Abraham. To Abraham Lincoln. There you go. Seward was a staunch abolitionist, lived in Auburn, New York, just like me, sold me the first house. William That's because we were free. That be his name. Go ahead on. So, so when I moved there to Auburn, she said, Harriet, you should write a book. I said, well, I don't know how to write. I don't know how to read. She said, well, if you tell me your story, I put it in a book. So she put it in a book. And this is the book. Auburn. That'd be Auburn, New York. <laughs> W.J. Moses, printer. Ain't it something that the printer has the same name as <laughs> Moses? And what them numbers say? 1869. Mm -hmm, that's when this book was wrote about, 1869. And I thank you very much. You read, you read mighty fast. <laughs> Well, so, no, ma'am, I, I never did learn to, to read and write, and that's, that's one of the sad things. But, like I said, that Freedman's Bureau taught lots of my people how to read and write. But there was other things that the Freedman's Bureau done. Tried to uh, connect the families that had been separated by the war and just by slavery, period. Well... Taught them how to cipher and keep count of the money and made a bank and taught them how to do other skills. That made it all good and it made legal that marriages be recognized by the white man. Marriages that was made as slaves. 
That's another thing that the Freedman's Bureau done. Well, I think I'll take one more question. And who will it be? <laughs> it won't be you. <laughs> And there's been a lot of discussion where there's certain blocks that told you certain things. I have told railroad. you that I have seen a quilt hanging on mm -hmm. a fence post. <coughs> I did not say nothing about no color, no pattern, no nothing. Mm -hmm. So, well, I believe my time is about up. <laughs> I had another question. But I only have this <laughs> to say. If you have learned something, or if you have enjoyed this, you may applaud. home. In fact, when Harriet Tubman died, she did not have enough whatevers, and neither did her family, to get a tombstone, a grave marker. So the people in Auburn, because they loved Harriet so much, they erected a stone in her honor. And it says, here lies Harriet Tubman. She led, oh, 300 people or however many on about 13 trips. There, there's a lot of discussion about how many people Harriet really did lead to freedom. Um, but the last line of it says what Harriet said herself. She wrote her own epitaph. I never run my train off the track and I never lost a passenger. <laughs> And then I'll be done, Thomas. Okay. Okay. You mentioned about the quilt and the patterns and the blocks. And I do have a quilt up here on stage. However, in Harriet's book, there is mention of a quilt, nothing about color, blocks, pattern. In, year, in recent years, there was published in 1998 this book that's called Hidden in Plain View mm -hmm. that talks about the patterns and the, and the blocks on the quilt. That book created a great deal of controversy. There are people who are quilt historians, textile historians. I never knew there were people like that until I started doing this. They said, no, it's a lie. Other people said, no, it isn't. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. <laughs> I tend to lean to the people who say, no, it isn't. Because all of the quilts, all of the patterns that are purported to be in the underground quilt patterns, they were not all in use during the time of the war. They did not come into common usage until the 1870s. So it makes for a good story, but it does not make for good history. And that's kind of what I went to. Then you asked me about smuggling of Mexican immigrants. I am Harriet Tubman. I have no knowledge of Mexico and immigrants, so I could not respond to that question because I know nothing about that. But if we were doing, what do you call it, alternative history? Um, yeah. What if? Counterfactual. Counterfactual. <laughs> exactly. I would say that yes, the smuggling of illegal immigrants into the U.S. would be comparable to the Underground Railroad. The Underground Railroad is probably one of the first acts of civil disobedience in the history of our country. Well, maybe the Boston Tea Party. Yeah. <laughs> but, but they're on the same level. 
I was not trying to dish you or nothing. You know. But I, I could not respond. Because when I am Harriet Tubman, I am Harriet Tubman. I've had people ask me about airplanes and <laughs> television and videography. I have no idea what that is. Because I'm Harriet Tubman. Got it? <laughs> However, I had a good upbringing, a comeuppance, from a child in the fifth grade. I was at her school and I, we were really into the Harriet stuff and the kids were really paying attention. But the room had to be like 106 degrees. And I got really hot and I took my gloves off. And she said, you're not Harriet Tubman because you have on red fingernail polish. <laughs> it taught me a very important lesson. When you are in character, you stay in character. And as my friend in the back, Katie, says, you'll know when Catherine is done because she takes her glove and her scarves off, and then she's Catherine. And that's who I am. My name is Catherine Harris. You must get away. Should you run? Should you hide? Oh, 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 you must find a way. Climb a tree, be a bush, or maybe faith will send the